We thank the Lord for giving us this privilege so that we can continue and summarize today. There are very many things that we could discuss and uh, about uh, relationships and uh, marriage. What I have done, as you have noticed, remember I told you marriage requires a lot of hard work, and that's what we'll talk about. You'll see some of the work that is involved. There are some books that I have sent to Elder Elder One, uh, Elder Zero Zero One. Uh, Brian to send to you and if you go to if you go to your meetings uh, if you go to your meet no if you go to your phones uh, you will uh, you, on whatsapp you'll see those messages many 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 books I'll mention them here as we move on now there's a book I told you to read and uh, that book is a very interesting book by the way uh, you read that one and you read it carefully you'll have gone a very long way towards uh, having a God-honoring, glorifying marriage. So I have summarized that book, and uh, I, have, uh, I have looked at the things that they have brought. Because you read there, I want to augment with some of uh, my, my reflections. So one, what I want to share with you very briefly is what I'm calling 13, the 13 things I want you to know before you get married. And by the way, these things are projected on your screen and therefore we had hoped you'll do PowerPoint but the team that was working on PowerPoint do what is very efficient the team the power disappeared so we will share we'll share what we will share what we have so 13 things I want you to know before you get married number one and this is important, that being in love is not an adequate foundation for building a successful marriage. In other words, we are saying for you to stay happily married, you know, to be happily married and to stay in the marriage over the long haul, love is not enough. You see, we talk a lot about love, oh, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love. But the, the, the idea that we bring about love is not a very old uh, idea where you felt, you, you know, you married somebody who you felt that you loved. It's not a very old idea. It began uh, during the, you know, the Enlightenment period, if you have uh, studied the, the philosophies and the, the ages of the yesterday Enlightenment period. And, uh, you know, it begins in, it, it's a philosophy that came, which focused on uh, feelings. During this pe uh, period, which we call the Romantic uh, period, there was interest, in fact, there is Romantic literature, romantic, uh, romantic music, Romantic, you know, even the art and even the buildings and uh, so it was a whole whole shift in philosophy and paradigm and uh, during that time uh, that's when by the way romantic love began is where there was interest in the common man and the childhood the, you know interest in strong senses emotions and feelings and there was awe of nature and there was a celebration of the individual and the importance of the imagination that came to the forefront and uh, that's when people started saying wait a minute when i'm getting married when i get married i need to feel something you know that's why it, you know and the focus on feelings and the senses and emotions to uh, for you know came to the fore and therefore people started saying when you're getting married you must have some very strong feelings for the person and uh, feelings became the basis for which you based your decisions i feel like doing this i feel like doing this not unlike the earlier years and so i want you to understand i want you to we'll look at the questions when we finish this one very quickly write those questions and then we'll go through them uh, because we will give it some time now so the focus was on on feelings but now there's something i want you to notice uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen you can write those questions we'll look at them when we 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 we, we go we we reach the end now when you read the bible according to the bible the basis of love love the love as defined in the bible is not the feeling thing it is agape agape is the love of god now, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 8, you have it in your screen. 
you'll discover where it says love is kind, love is patient, love is, uh, you know, does not keep a record of wrong. Is where you di discover that living, you know, and expressing that agape love is very difficult. In fact, you reach a place when you look at it and you try to keep it, is where you, dis you know, to exhibit that kind of love, is where you discover that um, it's very difficult for any human being to express that love. Yet, this is the love that God expects in marriage and in our relationships. When you read uh, Ephesians 5, verse 25, husbands are told to agapao their wives, to love them with the love of God. The question comes, how can a human being who is self-centered, how can a human being who is self-centered really love the way God loves? The answer, of course, is in Ephesians 5, verse, eight, verse 18, that says, don't be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, only the Spirit of God in our lives can really make us have the real, the right kind of love. And therefore, real marriage involves a seeking for knowledge and making it work. And therefore, love, ladies and gentlemen, as we define it today, as you read it in the media, is not a solid, can, is not enough, is not adequate as a foundation for marriage. Number two, this follows the first. That romantic love has two stages. That's something I would need you to know. That strong romantic feelings they stay for about two years. And the moment, you know, when you push a car, a car will move some distance. You know, if you're pushing a car, it will move some distance because of momentum. But it will reach a place where it will come to a standstill. Uh, specialists in this area have told us those strong romantic feelings stay for about two years. And that's how the momentum of those feelings will take us into marriage. So to, to stay married, we need to understand what agape love is all about, that love that comes from God and how to get that love. And I've already said that the Holy Spirit is the source of that love. And we need to understand the five languages of love, five languages of love, and communicate love in the language of your spouse now. Of, uh, there are people who have come to me, you know, they are having a terrible marriage and uh, the man tells me, you know, I really love her. And the lady is saying, this man does not love me now. You know, the, the, he, he doesn't love me yet, I love him very much. It's, when you look at it, you say, really, the picture does not add up. That's when, you know, I, you know, this is something I read some time ago and it made a lot of sense. You need to understand your love language and you need to understand the language of your spouse or the person you're in a relationship with and communicate love in that language. Do you remember the problem of the Tower of Babel? They all had the same vision. They had the same uh, goal of building the Tower of Babel. But when they could not communicate in the same language, they had to part. They, they, I've seen people cry with a lot of pain when they are parting, but they cannot stay together because they feel they don't need, they don't love each other. Yet like, they love each other, it's just that they do not know how to express love in the language the person understands. And so, there's a book, uh, the notes are there, you know, and I hope they'll send these notes to you. There's a book uh, called uh, The Language, the Five Languages of Love is written by Gary Chapman, the person who has written this book. He says there are people who understand words of affirmation. So when you have to make it verbal, no matter what you do, if you don't speak, they'll not think you love them. You know, acts of service, there are some people who serve you through, there are some people who serve you through, uh, you know, they, they love you through service, they serve you. Receiving gifts. You know, there are some people who are very good in giving gifts and I've discovered, for example, this is the love language of my wife. And uh, so when I find some shoes, I find some socks and I find some shirt, I know it's the wife who is trying to tell me that she loves me. There is quality time. There are people who feel very good when they come home. You know, let's say your man, you are watching football, you put the, if, if that's the lang love language of your wife, you put off that television, you say, now, I want to listen to you. How was your day quality time and physical touch? And uh, how do you know the, lang the love language of the person? Remember words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, uh, quality time, physical touch. How do you know the love language of the person you are in in the relationship? 
Look at this and see how they express their love. Look at this and ex see how they express their love. And uh, it's very interesting, you know, when you read this and you look around, you can, you can be able to tell the love languages of uh, some people. For example, our president, President Kenyatta, one, his love language, one of them, of course, remember, it's not single love language, but there's the major one. There's this one you call physical touch. You see, you know, you know, I, you know he's always moving his hands, you know. Uh, so get to know your love language get to know her love language and communicate love language in that format. Now, number three, the other thing you need to know is that the saying like mother, like daughter, and like, and like father, and like son is not a myth. And by the way, this was the wisdom behind arranged marriages. You see, when you wanted to get married here in Africa, and, uh, you know, in these societies, before, rom you know, romanticism came on board, Parents would go and look at the family, and if they looked at the family and that family had good character, they would encourage you to go and marry in that place. Do you know why? Because they knew, and this is a saying, the fruit does not fall far from a tree. The fruit does not fall far from a tree. They understood instinctively the power of socialization and the family culture. And therefore, it's important to know that, um, in other words, when you, when you want to get married, please uh, pay due diligence. Uh, you may be so much in love when you meet in KU, but it's important to go back home. It's important to go back home and uh, look at his parents, look at her parents. In fact, they say, you know, when you want to marry a young lady, look at her mother. And, uh, and uh, if, let's say, she's 23, 24, 25, and the mother is 50, most likely that's the way your wife will be at 50. Probably not exactly looked but in terms of behavior and that kind of thing. And uh, a small confession to make, I, I met my mother-in-law, the lady who became my mother-in-law, many, many, many years ago. And uh, she treated me like a mother. She was very, she was very generous and kind to me. And uh, I had gone to Form 5 in a place called Kapenguria. They lived in Kitale. And uh, when I went there, she treated me like one of her sons. So we are very close with my brother-in-laws and my sister-in-laws. And um, so, you know, because I, you know, this is a lady I looked up to. I loved her very much. It was not difficult to love her daughter. And by the way, I have twin daughters, and according to our culture, the you know the Kikuyu culture, when you name your children, when you name your children, if you have twins, for example, you name them from your family. I have two daughters. The first one is called Wangari, named after my mother. The second one was supposed to have been named after my eldest sister, but I broke culture. I named her after my mother-in-law because she was not just a mother-in-law. A mother in love and what i thought i what i saw those days has been proved right when i got married to mary so like mother like daughter like father like son if for example you go to the home and you find you know your young lady and Ndwati has taken you to his home and you find the mother is uh, trembling you know like a leaf before Duati's uh, father then you better know that that will be an area of challenge. Now, this is something very, uh, listen, I'm not saying don't get married to that home because uh, if I did that way, I would not be a preacher of the gospel. I believe God, because of Calvary, God has given us the ability to change, but we need to do an inventory, you know, where we identify these things, and but in the book that I gave you, there is a way how you identify some of these traits and you discuss them so that you know the potential areas that may bring problems in your marriage. Number four, I wish I knew how to solve disagreements without arguing. I wish I knew how to solve disagreements without arguing. You know, many times, and this is a problem I've seen in the church, but then when we have our meetings in KU, when you bring an idea and uh, I disagree with it, you start saying, Pasi does not like me nowadays. No, 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 no. There's somebody who helped me in this. Uh, it was a friend of mine. He was called uh, Julius Muche. We were in, uh, 
we had uh, that was the place was 1919 uh, December 1919 December the place was Reading Reading in England near where we uh, we were studying theology we were people who had come from various theological schools or people who are from what it used to be called West Indies now it's called in Jamaica it's called the where it's called the North Caribbean University there are some people from West Africa the others from Bugema there are us from Baraton others were from the Philippines we met together and you know we were at that age where people like arguing and so I remember we were studying the lesson on uh, we were studying a lesson on uh, the book of Samuel studying about the character of David. So I brought an idea and immediately I brought that idea up. There is uh, somebody from, um, from uh, Ghana. He had come from uh, West Africa and used to say that he had done logic. He, he talked very loudly and using logic, he tried to show that what I had said was nothing. I had said nothing and therefore all those words were empty words and I was very, very, very hurt very very hard when we leave that place i told my friend listen i will not i i told him i told my friend listen i will not i will not i will not come back for this bible study again my friend told me you know kigundu you know there's something you need to know and by the way that's something i need to tell you to help you you need to separate your ideas from yourself don't put your self-esteem on your ideas so that when we shoot your idea, you believe we have shot you. No, 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 no. Separate the idea from yourself. And uh, should I bring an idea and, uh, you know, you bring that idea and show that that idea does not make sense. Well, that idea has loopholes. It's not, I'll simply, to me, I simply say, well, I had not thought about it that, which is true. But I do not, I, 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 when you ask me questions, I don't look at it like uh, you're abusing my intelligence. And so we need to know, number one, we can actually solve disagreements without ag ag arguing. We don't have to argue if we learn how to really, really communicate. And so very quickly, I want to introduce you to what we call five levels of communication, five levels of communication. There are five. We'll start at the most superficial one. The, the most superficial one is level five, is what you call cliche communication, is what you call cliche communication. Communica cliche communication is where you, sh you discuss, cliche communication is where you discuss whether, you know, it's superficial, how are you? And when I ask you, how are you, you know, I don't really want to know, so you don't get into details. Level number four is, uh, level number four is what you call sharing information, sharing informations. When I share information, you know, sharing facts and information, sharing facts and information. When I share information, you don't know what I think about it, and therefore, I remain a stranger to you. You know, for example, we, you know, on Wednesday, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we listen to, you know, all of us have our favorite uh, television stations for some reason. I discovered that uh, you end up watching the favorite uh, TV station of uh, the wife for some reason. I don't know how that happens. So we are on Citizen now. Oh, on Wednesday, there is J, J, F, J, F, K, John, J, Jeff Koinange live. And on Monday, there are all these guys, you know, Abijah and what have you. Yeah, the, when you listen to the news, they give you information. You don't know what they think. You don't know that they are excited. They just give you information. That is level four. Level three is where you share information, but you give your judgment and you give your opinion. In other words, you, you don't only say, you know, this, you know, there's COVID-19, but you, 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 you start saying, you know, this is what the worst thing that has ever happened to Kenya and you move on. You give your opinion, which helps us to understand you a little bit more. You are communicating. Yes, but now the real communication and this is where I was going happens at level two and level one. Level two is where you don't only share about the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Uh, 19 but you share your feelings and your emotions this is where you say you know as i look at this thing moving on i feel hopeless i am afraid you know i can't sleep at night when you do that way you give us the key to yourself because you have shared feelings and emotions that is level two and level one 
is where they are called peak moments. That is where two people are so attuned together. When one person speaks, the other person, especially when you're married, says that is just what I was thinking. So level one, level two is called dialogue. This is where, this is the communication of the, of the heart. This is where, you know, we, when you communicate at level one, level two, these are where relationships are made. And wh when you learn to communicate from level one, level two, it's called the secret of staying in love. Level three up to five, when you can communicate at that level, that is called discussion, discussion. So the problem why disagreements lead to arguments is because many times we do not dialogue, we discuss. L listen, you cannot be effective in, uh, you cannot be dis effective in communication, in dis your discussion will, be, will not be fruitful if you have not had dialogue. Now, when you come for premarital counseling sessions, we'll move into these ones into details. And by the way, a very good model to follow here is the one that we call the safe conversations, the one that Pollyanna and the team from the US taught us through the camp meeting. You read that one, you follow that way, let me tell you, you will have very fruitful discussions uh, and dialogue and moments and communications with your, your partner. Now, number five, I wish they told me that apologizing is a sign of strength. Some people have never said, some people have never apologized. Many of us try to justify ourselves. But let me tell you, when you make a mistake and somebody points out a mistake or you discover you made a mistake, please be humble in the spirit, spirit of Christ. Go and say, I am sorry. Go and say, I am sorry. So apologizing really is a sign of strength i remember one time when i was a pastor of new life church there's something i did young pastor full of energy very energetic and uh, i made the elders i had 18 i had 18 elders all of them older than me i made them very very embarrassed that was uh, you know the first uh, the first year the you know the first two months of uh, you know being pastor i realized that i had uh, i realized that i had a heart I had made a mistake and I had goofed big time. So I went to them and told them elders, I am very sorry I made a mistake. There is one elder, is, uh, is an elder in Starehe, is called Samuel Osore. For those who have been there, he made a statement that has stuck with me this time. And when I make a mistake, me, I say I'm sorry. He, he says, let me tell you, pastor, you are Christian. Pastor, you are Christian. Many people try to justify themselves, but many do not say they are sorry. Let me tell you, apologizing is a sign of strength. And that's why, even when you're a parent, when I see I've not made, you know, my children, I've, uh, I've done something, they are not happy. My wife is not happy. Even comrades in the office, you're not happy. I'm preaching and I say a statement and somebody is not happy. I look that person up and I say, I am sorry. Le remember, uh, when you apologize, when you apologize, you remove the barrier that would have hindered the relationship. And... When you apologize, as you read in the book, you need to understand the language of apology of your partner. One, expressing regret. Two, accepting responsibility. Three, making restitution. Four, ex genuinely expressing the desire to change behavior or requesting forgiveness. Understand how they understand, you know, how they understand apology. There's a, there's a saying in my language where we say, sorry, sorry, ilimaliza, um, sorry, sorry, ilimaliza, sani za mzungu. You see, there's this muzungu, according to the story, who had employed a clumsy house help, you know, someone in the house, who used to drop, uh, who used to drop plates and say, break, break plates and say, I'm sorry break plates and say that I am sorry. And uh, all the plates were, were finished. So you need to communicate apology in the language that that person understands. Just saying I'm sorry to some people is not enough. No, you need to understand how do they, and if you don't understand, ask them, tell them I feel very sorry. What can I do so that you can know I'm truly sorry? Number six, I wish they told me, and this is very important, 
that forgiveness is not a feeling but a decision. By the way, if you follow your feelings when somebody has wronged you, you will not feel like forgiving them. It is a decision. It is an act of the will. And this is what I have discovered, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And when I discovered this one, it became freeing. You know, if you follow your feelings, your feelings, uh, the, the, you know, the yo-yo, you know, like the waves of the ocean, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Today you're high, tomorrow you are down. So if, uh, if you wrong your spouse, or your spouse wrongs you and you you follow those feelings you will not stay together but forgiveness is a decision that you make by the way by the way when you make that decision i don't know i, I know all of us have been wrong even when you make that decision you say god forgive me and by the grace but and because god forgive me in christ i will forgive those ones who have wronged me remember the lord's prayer Remember the Lord's prayer and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When you choose to remove, to forgive, forgiveness removes the barrier and opens the possibility for growing, for the relationship to grow. So forgiveness is crucial, absolutely crucial, easier to have a strong relationship. Now, I hear there are some people when we talk, you know, about forgiveness in marriage. There are people who have some very interesting, uh, interesting ideas of forgiveness. They think, they say, you know, forgive and forget. No, I mean, how do you forget? How do you forget? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are some people who, you know, you don't forget is where you choose to overlook the wrong that was done to you. Number two, forgiveness does not remove all the consequences of wrongdoing. Yes, I, you know, I may forgive you or you may forgive me, but I messed you up. Now, imagine. There's a young lady, yeah, a young man plays with a young lady and uh, makes her pregnant and then he abandons her. And he leaves her to her devices, he goes for a long time, comes five years later and starts saying, I am sorry. She has suffered so much and probably the consequences were wrong. You know, she, she got, you know, she, she, you know, she was able to, you know, the, the consequences of that abandonment was a lot probably she went home she was thrown away from home she's feeling very bad you come and say oh yeah 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 what what forgive me yes they'll forgive you but uh, the consequences are still there there's something else forgiveness does not reduce the trust you have to work at recreating trust prove slowly over a long time that you are trustworthy and by the way, forgiveness does not always lead to reconciliation. Yes, you may go and tell him you're sorry. She may tell you she's, she's sorry, but that does not mean when I say I forgive you, that, that the relationship will come back to the same way. Sometimes relationships are broken, messed up irreparably, and uh, we have to reach a place where we forgive one another, we say we have no grudges against each other, and I say, sister or my brother, let us meet in the kingdom of heaven, be faithful, we'll meet in the kingdom of heaven. Now number seven is a very interesting one. The other thing, I wish, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I knew is that toilets are not self-cleaning. You see, uh, when you come to a home when you're married, there are things to be done in the home rules. Now, a question comes, which rules in the home are for men and which are for women? And where do these ideas or these rules come from? And the main question, of course, comes, does the Bible specify the rules? Now, when you look at the Bible, the, you know the Bible, you know, I, well, I'm not talking about reading the Bible. The Bible, the Bible simply explains to us the Jewish culture. God chose to reveal himself through that culture. It, it does not mean that what they did was great, like David having two, you know, all those wives, that was great. Some people say, oh, David did it in the Bible. He was a man after God's own heart. No, it's through that culture. And so some of the things written in the Bible are not normative. What we need to do is look for principles and apply those principles. Not just the principles, but, the, you know, we have the spirit to help us apply those principles in our life. And uh, you realize the society has changed. 
and uh, many times men, women, they go for work. Sometimes a man comes early or in this age of COVID, you may be working from the home like I do. Now, when you walk, when you walk from the home and my wife goes a little bit, the, the cooking, there is some cooking that has to be done. There are some utensils that have to be done. Now, I do them now. The problem comes when you wait to say, I'll wait for her to come and watch them, it will bring a lot of strain. And uh, by the way, most of the times it is selfish. You know, the way we divide rules. You sit here, one person labors like a donkey while you are sitting down. The way forward is this. You sit down and list down all what is to be done. All what is to be done in your home, all the rules. And then you ask the question, what are you good at? What are you good at? Probably, you may know how to cook ugali very well. Then I cook, pick, and I pick a mboga. Go to the kitchen together. Let her cook the ugali. Cook the you let cook the ugalis. Let her cook the mbogas as you talk. And for men, I think this is a good way of socializing uh, your children. For example, uh, by the way. You know, when you go to the kitchen and you talk there, you know, you, you do a lot of groundwork for the heart. When you go to the kitchen and you do that. Now, uh, I'm good in uh, making juice. I'm good in baking carrot cake. When you come to my place next time, tell me to make you carrot cake. I, you know, carrot cake and, you know, banana bread and corn bread and uh, lemon and all those things. I, I'm good in making. Now, my wife likes when I make them because I follow the ingredients. She's in a hurry, too much in a hurry to follow the ingredients. But when you look at the tasks in the home, you know, we ask, what can you do? What are you good at? And we divide them that way, you know, in the spirit of give and take because this is our home. And so remember, toilets are not self-cleaning. You, somebody has to do some work in the home. Divide them equitably. Now, number eight, that now, 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 listen, please. I wish somebody told me this, that I needed a plan for handling our money. You need a plan for handling your money when you come together. You need a plan for handling your money. Many of us never, our parents did not know, and remember the blind cannot lead the blind, so they did not teach us how to deal with money. So you need a plan. You need to understand how to handle money, the two of you. And what I have done, what I have done, ladies and gentlemen, I, has, I sent a book, a book called The Three Simple Rules of Finances by Theo Bors. I sent, him to, I sent it to Brian Onyango, and he has already sent it to all of you. Please, don't get married before you read that book. And don't get married before you discuss that book. And don't get married before you come up with a way of handling your money. Let me tell you, if there's a place people fight, it is in this area of money. I have sent you a book. It is in your WhatsApp um, WhatsApp uh, email address, WhatsApp, uh, you know, groups, various groups. Brian has already done that. So please, you need a plan. You need a plan. Understand the money. Don't make the same mistakes your father and mother made. Listen to me. You can be very spiritual, but if you don't know how to drive a car, I'll not get into the car. So you may be very spiritual, but if you don't know how to handle finances, you may pray, you may fast, and you'll still be poor. So please understand and respect these principles of handling money. Number nine, I did not know that uh, mutual sexual fulfillment is not automatic. You see, many people make an assumption that because you have the equipment, um, is a Sabbath, so the language, uh, the, lang the language is kosher. Well, but anyway, I will talk about that. You know, having the equipment is not enough. And there's something I need to tell you you who are not married, without commitment, without commitment, there is always fear at the back of the mind. So the sexual experience you have when there is no commitment is like taking a frothy soda with fake sugar. It's not the real thing. Why don't you wait for the real thing with the security of marriage where you look at her, you say, baby, 
You can now surrender yourself completely to me. I have given you the security of marriage. Without marriage, without marriage, you're being selfish and you cannot understand sexuality in the real sense of the word. Now there is a book that was written by Stephen Covey, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I saw it was edited, but uh, there's a chapter he says, don't be a married illiterate. Don't be a married illiterate. Many people perish because of lack of knowledge. And uh, when I'm talking about knowledge or in this area, I'm not talking about the, that information that comes from that make-believe fake porn world where, you know, go and watch pornography and uh, we start looking at stuff and we start thinking they are, that is, uh, you know, that's the way sexuality needs to be. No, read wholesome book written by men and women of God. And again, 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 in other words, I'm saying, don't go for that make-believe world of Hollywood that, uh, you know, you know that, uh, you know the where, you know, people have sexual orgies and that kind of thing. That is not, not normal sex, ladies and, and gentlemen. You know, real sexuality, ladies and gentlemen, when you understand it, is worship. That's why I'm saying read all wholesome books. Like now, there's a book that um, we'll send to you soon after this. It's called The Act of Marriage by Tim Lahaye. The Act of Marriage by Tim Lahaye. Tim Lahaye is a believer. There's another book that has already been sent into your WhatsApp group by Elder Brian. It's called Intended for Pleasure by Ed Wheat. They wrote that one with his wife, Intended for Pleasure. It will introduce us to wholesome sexuality. Wholesome sexuality. The sexuality I'm, I'm, I'm decrying is the one that we, you know, when you, when you, when you open your television, when, when you put up your phone, there are very many sites and you're told this one, la, 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 hey, hey, hey. 10 ways to make her longing. Uh, 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 uh. I'm talking about whole, wholesome sexuality. There is a book I'm walking through right now. It's called Pure Sex, uh, The Spirituality of Sexual Desire. Did you ever think that, uh, you know, I remember we, I was with a friend of mine who had come from um, a place uh, called Gesima. And we were discussing when we were young boys, we were not married. And I was wondering, now. I asked him a question. I asked him a question. You know, when you get married, when you get married and, uh, you know, the time has come to salute the queen. I'm using kosher, clean language to salute the queen. Would you say, let us pray? He says, of course not, of course not. You see, we do not as connect and associate God with sexuality. Remember, male and female, he created them. And uh, therefore, you know, sexuality is spiritual. And probably what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I know I'm, I'm offering. The, I, I've been asked by Akinan Duati and the stewardship team to present a stewardship, stewardship presentations. So probably on uh, the Sabbath when we are ending, when we will be ending the week of prayer, we can talk about uh, stewards of sexuality. Remember, stewardship is not just about uh, money. It's also everything that God has given us. How do I steward the gift of sexuality? Male and female, he created them. So that is, we can do a whole series on that one at a later date, because this is, um, this is a, uh, deep, deep, deep subject. And, uh, you know, we need wholesome uh, information. I remember when my daughters were eight, we had gone to preach somewhere in South Africa. I'm the one who taught them sexuality and the idea on sexuality and the idea was this, that, uh, you know, they need to learn to be comfortable with their sexuality. You know, I remember drawing sketches for them. That was 2007. They were, yes, they were about eight years. I drew, I, I did the sketches for them and I explained and I explained and I explained. Later, somebody went to teach them, you know, somebody, they went, somebody went to present, they were still small and asked them a question and they answered so that you are surprised. You see, when you're a parent and you teach sexuality to your children, you're simply telling them, this is some, not something to be ashamed of or embarrassed about. And when you have questions, you can always come to me. That communication is very, very important. Number 10, 
please no right now when you when you're getting married uh, you know we were not told uh, we did not know that i was marrying into a family you know some of us you just see the person you're excited about each uh, each other and uh, when you get married or when you're arranging the, for the wedding that's when you discover there is a family there is another reality between the two of you this is where by the way you need to analyze that family and uh, if for example the, the somebody who asked me is there anything wrong with marrying from another tribe you know my position on that i analyze yourself if you see you cannot handle it leave it alone leave it alone if you know you when you go through counseling and you find that uh, there's still a lot of fear you know you discuss and you're still afraid please leave leave that alone you know when fear is holding you looks like probably that is not your destiny but uh, my view is very simple kenya is not going backwards to the small tribal enclaves that we had and because we are not going back we can only move ahead and that's why when i talk to young people i i i look into a kenya where people will be mixed up you know marrying you know tunakuwa kama giveri no giveri you can even see the maize and the beans we can be like uh, mokimo mokimo is where you mash the food together and that is the way tanzania is you go to tanzania you can settle anywhere in that country you can marry anywhere they say sis in your tanzania i hope you reach there as a country because this tribalism in kenya is a demon that is uh, wrecking havoc in this country in the politics in employment in everything uh, and so i i pray that uh, god uh, will bring some courage as the people in this group who will inter who will marry at the other person who will intermarry because at the end of the day you stay in ku with somebody for for five for four five years and we are seeking the lord we become one remember efficient says jesus broke these barriers so if you you feel it's difficult that's all right but if you feel you can handle it may the lord bless you and i'll officiate in your i'll officiate in your wedding i'll officiate in your marriage now remember genesis 2 verse 24 the man shall leave cliff and become one flesh remember that one so remember you're marrying into a family but if you have to have a to be a happy family you must live we talked about that one yesterday with a family you must move from dependence to independence to interdependence i talked about that one yesterday and now when you get married please remember when you marry you 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 the new family is like a, you know a field where there are no boundaries anything can pass there you must erect boundaries to protect your marriage how do you do that there is a book I have sent to Brian. It's called Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. When to say yes and when to say no. You must learn to say yes to your family. You must learn to say no to your family and not become guilty about it. So it will also help you to erect boundaries in marriage. And that is very important. 11, I will not explain that spirituality is not equated with going to church that spirituality is not equated going to church ladies and gentlemen some of us you know i have no you know i i marry somebody who comes to kuzda somebody who doesn't care about god has no need for you know the spirit you know to follow the lord closely i remember there's a there's a when i was in baraton there's a young lady i saw yeah we she was singing in the university chorale she used to sing very well uh, barack really probably understands what i'm talking about uh, she was not uh, she was not uh, kikuyu i need to meet tribe really is neither here nor there so anyway i i talked to her i said you know sister and i i dropped my cv you know <laughs> shared what was in my heart she looked at me she says give me some time you know so I, she says well let's talk about after you know four five days she came and told me kigundu i thought about what you're saying but no she says i say she says no you know you are 
you're very spiritual, you're very intense with God. I'm, I'm not sure when I want to go all that way. And so going to church, going to church, the fact that somebody comes to church does not mean they are spiritual. The only person who is spiritual is the one who has been born again and who has received the Holy Spirit and they are seeking to follow the Spirit of God. They are led by the Spirit. That is a person who is spiritual. Twelve. This is where your book ended. I did not know that personality profoundly influences behavior. You know, that personality profoundly influences behavior. All of us are different. Some of you are extroverts, others are introverts. By the way, for your information, I'm 81% introvert. I enjoy my company. Me, I am thriving during this time of COVID. I am home. I am reading. I'm writing. I'm preaching from my home. Uh, an introvert is somebody who can stay in the house for a whole month, one week, two weeks, and not miss anybody. The truth is, I don't miss anybody probably except my wife, uh, you know, because of my choice. I, but I can, uh, I can stay on my own and I, I'm all right. Give me, give me the Bible, give me books, and let me share the way I'm sharing, all right, and that kind of thing. Now, when we got married, I did not know this was a problem because, on the other hand, my wife is an extrovert. My wife cannot finish a day at home in the house. In the house, she has to move, greet a neighbor, or do something. Est extroverts get energized when they go outside. Introverts get energized when, when they stay within. So now, she will say, let's go now. Now, when she goes, when she's leaving the house, I would feel that I would think that she's not, you know, she's not interested in me. She doesn't enjoy my company and I would feel very bad. So when she's going, you know, I would, I would why, why is she leaving? We were having a perfect time. And that she would tell me I'm very antisocial and la, 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 la. And that's why, by the way, when you, when you get married, when, when, when I do weddings, unless we are very close, I don't go for the reception. Uh, yeah, you know, just to go and sit there and uh, uh, uh. no, 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 no. But uh, for you know, for Kuzdarians, I usually go because you're family. But usually, I don't go for I usually don't go for receptions. I after I've done my thing. Me, I do my thing. When I go to town, I I do my thing. If I'm going to four offices, I go to four offices. I come back. You know, I when I'm moving out, there has to be an agenda. So do you, what is your personality? I want you to understand your personality. Let us understand the personality and how do you know your personality? There's something I have put there and it's a website, www.16personalities.com. When you go through that one, it will it'll explain to you who you are. When I read it, I was amazed. I'm what you call a mediator. I'm what you call a mediator. So really, when you see when you see me as a pastor, and you find I'm not very. I don't come to visit you in your hostels. Please don't bash me on the head. God did not create me that way. Yes, I try once in a while, but that is not that is not me. So there is a. It helps us understand each other. Lastly, but this one was. Um, Lastly, this was not in your books, but this is something I wish you knew, that men and women are equal but different. Men and women are equal than, and, than, and, and, uh, but different. You see, you make an assumption when you talk, you're so excited about one another, or you start saying, oh, we are so equal, we are so equal, we are so equal. No, 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 no. no. Remember, you have the same destiny, but this is your help me. So she has to be different from you so that your mission can be complete. There's a book, again, that has been sent to you by Brian Onyango. It's called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus by John Gray, Ph.D. Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus by John Gray, Ph.D. Then there are two other books that I would recommend. You can find them. You can find them uh, in the shops in town, or you can buy them online. Uh, who knows? Who knows? There's one called For Men Only. It's a book that talks about the inner lives of women. It is to help men understand their wives. And there's another one called For Women Only. This one is to help women understand the inner lives of men. 
when you look at these 13 things, you notice that marriage takes a lot of work. Now, if when you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a doctor like Brian Mosotti, you take six, seven years, you know, getting ready to be a doctor. And if you go for your master's PhD, that takes even longer. If you want to be an engineer, uh, five years, uh, I think it's probably five years or something like that. And uh, if you want to be, you know, a teacher, three years, if you want to be an accountant, three years, what about this thing called marriage? that determines the quality of li your life in this world and the, the destiny, your destiny in the world to come. We need to do all this work. So read all those books, have that knowledge at the fingertips and ensure that God is in your life. Ask him to give you the wisdom that comes from above so that these are not just external principles, but you are able to internalize these principles. And when we get this roadmap and the, and the Lord brings us together and we take these things into account, I believe the Lord will give us grace to have a strong, strong, strong marriage and family. And remember, I end with these words. I end with these words. These are the words, words that I want to use to end. And these words are a well-ordered family preaches more than a thousand sermons. My prayer is that all of you and the people that you'll marry and the children who we will be born out of union will be blessed from the insights the Lord has revealed to us this week is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Sorry, I see we have a few minutes, but uh, that's what I had for you today, comrades. God bless.